All right, so we're going to try and take now what we talked about this morning. So this morning we heard some consumer leaders share their story. They talked about what it looked like for them as they went from individuals experiencing homelessness, engaged with a health center, became leaders within that health center, the staff that assisted them in that, and then how patients were helped. That's really the process we want to look at as we move forward this afternoon, is we really want to think clearly about who are the different players, for lack of a better word, who are the different people involved in the process of consumer engagement, and what support do each of those people need? What are the challenges that they face? What, what's the support that they need? What opportunities are available because that person is engaged? Even as we think about for that individual, but also for the agency, almost like a SWOT kind of evaluation. That's what we want to look at now. So this is a, a viewpoint discussion um, that we're going to have. Whenever you have a viewpoint discussion, one of the weaknesses of this is as we look at the viewpoint of each individual, we're obviously grossly categorizing people, right? Where we're saying, here's this person, and we're making assumptions about that person, and we're kind of putting everyone into a category. So that's a weakness of this discussion, is that we just want to recognize that while we are, in essence, talking about the different kinds of people that are engaged in the process of consumer engagement, we also recognize there are limitations here. Because as we said this morning, there are providers who are also consumers, who are also serving as the staff liaison, who are also engaged with new patients. And so there's, it's not quite as neatly divided as what we're going to describe here today. But we're going to just for the sake of having some structure, some framework by which we describe it, that's how we're gonna kind of jump in. But please do extend grace in the sense that we realize there are limitations around categorizing people in any way, right? So we wanna look at, as we think about, Myra shared her story this morning, and I think Myra did a really good job. I've heard Myra, Myra's uh, presented with me on a few webinars, explain this really well, of this, this transition of, of all the different people who were involved as she went from being someone who was currently unhoused but very aware of the resources around her, right? She said that she was very quick, that she was able to advocate well for herself. She said that this morning, that she was able to say, hey, can I have some of your bacon, right? And she was okay if they said no, right? But she also was, was able to ask, right? So the first person that we're going to look at, we're going to put everyone up here, and then we'll look at the individuals. Uh, I don't have any internet on my laptop. So instead of slides, I'm using these high-quality pieces of paper. These were very expensive. So if you're the one up here holding it, and some of you will be, you know, be careful with it, because this is, this is pretty classy. All right, so the consumer will be represented by... Kayla, <laughs> I see that hand. Okay, so Kayla's going to be our consumer. She's going to sit right here. I'm going to, if you can't see that sign, that's more for me than for you. All right, and then Myra was engaged by consumer leaders, so by the members of her cab. Who wants to be my cab member? It's exciting. Yes, right there. Sorry, everyone else who raised their hand. I called on her first. All right, so you're going to sit here and hold this sign for about two hours <laughs> Sorry, all right, you can sit right here. <laughs> then we have the staff liaison to the cab. Who wants to be the staff liaison? Meredith, woohoo! Come up, all right. Yeah, let's give her a hand. She doesn't want to do this, okay. Yes, I do. All right. Who wants to be the provider? Paul, yes, awesome. Come on down, woohoo! Well, there is a real, you can always tell the after lunch, right? <laughs> like. You know, wow, you're a lot. We just ate. We're tired. All right, so Paul is a provider. By provider, we mean he could be a, he could be a doctor. He could be the patient relations staff. He could be the guy that does intake. He could be the clinical social worker. He is the, he is the health center staff or the shelter staff that are uh, engaging with or benefited by or perhaps threatened by consumer leadership. All right, and then when we talk about new patient, we're talking about the person, the, the 
this is a consumer who's coming in who's very well established in the community. She knows how to find resources. She knows how to get the help she needs. Other, other consumers look to her for help and assistance. When we say new patient, we're talking about someone who's come into the health center. They're not sure what to expect. They're having trouble navigating the system. They don't know how to make the right appointment. They don't know how to get there. They don't know how to get their prescription filled. This is, so by new patient, that's what we mean, is someone who probably because of the crisis they're facing, because of the way they've been treated by the medical community, because of the way they've been treated by even their friends and family, is having a difficult time navigating their own physical health condition, the medical system, all of that. Who wants to be the new patient? Woohoo! I know it's exciting. Don't get too, don't get too worked up. Okay, so we want to think through, in all of these people, again, we're making general categories, general categories here, what are the strengths that each person brings? What are the fears they may have? What barriers may they face? What opportunities do they have, both as an individual and as um, what opportunities they bring for the health center? We're looking at, at consumer engagement from this person's perspective, okay? So first we have Kayla. Are you excited, Kayla? Yes. That was convincing, wasn't it? She's, all right, bring it down, Kayla. Okay, so, <laughs> woo, so exciting. Kayla's on staff, and so she has to be here. And I supervise Kayla, so she has to sit here like this. But it's okay, she would want to, wouldn't you? Yes. Yes, see, she loves this. This is not trauma-informed supervision right here. <laughs> here, hold a piece of paper and sit in front of 100 people you don't know. So, anyway, still. So, remember in Myra's story, Myra talked about, as we said earlier, that she was unhoused, but she was quickly, actually we don't know how quickly, but at some point she was able to develop strategies around, wait a minute, how am I going to find what I need? How am I going to find what I need? She developed strategies like, you know what, I'm going to keep my clothes washed. I'm going to be th thoughtful about how people think about me and how I present. And at the same time, felt like in some ways I don't care what anyone thinks, right? So she was thoughtful. She had strategies. She was able to advocate for herself. She was able to find help within the community, right? And then something that's unique about her story and that would be a part of the story of each of these consumer leaders that we've talked about is she was becoming a resource for other people in the community, right? Other people experiencing homelessness were beginning to come to her and go, hey, how'd you find that? Where'd you get that? What do I do? I've got this prescription, what should I do with it, right? And she was becoming someone that people came to for help and advice. So she was receiving services at the health center and she was becoming sort of a resource in her community, right? So what as she decides, or maybe she doesn't, as she decides, you know what, I'm, I'm pretty good at this, right? As Kayla decides, I'm pretty, pretty good at this, I'm able to help some people. What challenges, what strengths, what barriers would she face if she was going to engage the health center or her metro council or her local shelter or her, the food pantry where she receives food or the clothing closet? If she wanted to engage and be part of that process, part of that system, what challenges would she face? What opportunities would there be? What strengths would she bring? What, what is the viewpoint of a consumer in this situation when it comes to consumer engagement? Cowboy. Ex absolutely right. I'm going to repeat what people say so that everyone doesn't have to get up and go to the microphone. She would have to learn two things, Cowboy said. Number one, she would have to learn client confidentiality, right? What if she doesn't? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, there's a huge threat there, right? Oh, yeah, there's a huge risk here. If she starts talking about patients, is there a risk to her in the community if she starts sharing medical information about patients? Oh, yeah. There's a HIPAA violation, but there's also a risk for her, right? What if she goes back to her camp and starts telling someone what, they were di what, what Bob was diagnosed with? She's going to get sued, she could get beaten up, all kinds of things could happen, right? So she has to learn about confidentiality. Does that put her in an awkward position with her peers? Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Boundaries. She's going to have to learn some boundaries of when she can help and when she can't. If she's still experiencing homelessness or if she's unstably housed, 
Is there a risk that she could become so helpful to others that she loses her housing and she can't meet her goals? Oh, yeah. Her whole life could become about helping other people, right? Oh, that is an excellent point. The survivor's guilt that she could feel. I, I have helped house so many people that as soon as they got housing, they brought 10 people into their apartment and they were kicked out and their rental history was it. So what if she starts helping people? <laughs> what if she starts helping people out of a desire to compensate for her own weaknesses, her own failures? Mm-hmm. you know, recently housed, I didn't go through a housing organization, I just got an apartment. But one of the things that I did was bring other people to my house. You know, um, I was not working for the health care for the homeless program. Um, and I think that is a real thin line when, you were, when you've been on the streets for many years and being a consumer and you got the resources it's not about the HIPAA for me it was about learning the boundaries I think that's the biggest one how many of us as those of us who are not consumers who are helpers in whatever way how many of us have the worst boundaries right boundaries is a whole nother training <laughs> some of us need a, need an all day on on uh, boundaries, right? We do lots of trainings on boundaries because there are so many ways, there's so many reasons that we can help people that are dysfunctional. I'm gonna save you, I feel guilty because I'm not in the position that you're in. I feel like I have all the answers and so I owe you something. I feel like I have to make up for something in my past. I feel like I have to make up for the privilege that I feel like I have that you didn't. I feel like I owe the world something. I feel like I'm commanded to do this by my higher power or my parents or I'm doing this out of, you know, fulfilling some commandment or I, right? Many of us have decided I'm going to mother someone, I'm going to save someone, I'm going to take care of you, you're going to be my new baby. <sighs> That's dysfunctional, right? These are adults we're talking about. These are adults we're talking about. How many of us decide we're basically going to take them under our wing and I'm going to solve your problems, I'm going to take good care of you and these are my people and these are adults. They don't belong to you, right? So, I kind of got off there, Kayla. Um, so yes, she, as a consumer who has learned how to strategize, how to advocate for others, who has learned how to help others, there's a lot of things that she's going to have to figure out and that we hopefully can be supportive and help figuring out. But sometimes what we can do is we can find someone, we can meet someone and go, oh my gosh, you're amazing. Look at how you've navigated the system. Look at how people come to you and they trust you. And we start seeing all this, oh, you're gonna be real helpful, right? And we start seeing all these ways that they can help. And we forget that there is some risk here for this person right? And there is, there's going to be uh, pain that this person feels and risk that they feel and loss that they feel within their own community. Someone mentioned beautifully earlier, this person may suddenly be put on a pedestal and who am I now and what am I doing now, right? So all kinds of things that can go through this person's heart and mind as they try to engage. Now, what does she need in order to get connected with the health center. If she's going to be a part of governance, she's going to contribute meaningfully to the health center or the shelter or to, to your agency, how does she do that? How does she go from being this person who's an active advocate, helper in their community to being meaningfully connected? Okay, so yes, hopefully by this person. What's your name there? Cathedral. Oh, that's beautiful. Cathedral. Cathedral is representing our consumer leaders that are already engaged, right? So the question to ask yourself as you think about consumer, I'm not doing anything weird back here, don't worry. <laughs> the creepiness of having someone with a microphone behind you. Where many of you are, where your consumer engagement is breaking down, is that this person has no me meaningful way to get engaged. 
unless they really make it happen, right? Unless they're on your website and they're calling the calls and they're coming to the meetings and saying, hey, right, they've got to make it happen. So this right here is where consumer engagement breaks down very often in many of your agencies, is this person is out there doing something meaningful, but they don't know how to get connected. So what we heard in the story this morning with Myra is that there was a cab at her health center and there were people in that cab that were looking for people like this. And they were calling it out. They were calling it out. Cowboy has beautiful stories of people that he has seen and thought, I see something there. And he's called it out. He, Deidre said that this morning, right? Deidre said, someone saw something in me, and here I am. Someone called that out in Deidre, right? Someone looked at Deidre and said, there's something amazing in there. There's a desire to help. There's an ability to help. Come on. Come on, let me show you how to do it, right? And that, took, uh, that takes patience, and that takes commitment, and that takes, right? So who are the people in your agency that are calling it out, that are looking for it? There's someone. There's someone who wants to get involved. Not manipulating. Hey, if you want to keep receiving services here, we're going to need you to come to the cab meeting. Right? I've, been to, I've seen agencies like that. We have to have 10 people there, so if you want to keep receiving services, you've been here for five years, we're going to need you to kind of come to a meeting, and there's going to be donuts. Right? So... What does this look like in your agency where this person like Cathedral is looking for people like Kayla and calling it out? And what are the open doors? What doors is Cathedral opening for Kayla to walk through, right? So someone tell me, what does that look like in your life? What does that look like in your health center? How has this process worked? And this may not be a cab member. This may be that a staff member does this. But what does this calling out process look like in your health center? One, we have the providers looking for those individuals that not only take and advocate for themselves, but they advocate for others. That's one of the, one of the persons that we look for. And the other one is that we have individuals that's part of our cab that's constantly telling other people about the cab and asking them if they would come to one of our meetings so they can get to know the cab. And we have a procedure the way you just don't come the first time and become a member. You have to come at least six times. And after coming six times, then you get voted in. And then there's other things for you to do once you become a cab member. That is awesome. Lots of open doors, but also structure. Someone else, what was the first time you were invited to cab? To cab? How did you go from being a consumer who was helping other people to actually being a part of the system? Cece, you can go to that mic right there. Well, in Miami, what we do is you have to come to three consecutive meetings of the cab. And I was approached during the survey time. Yes, because we do consumer surveys. So one of the cab members approached me to give me a survey and explain to me what the cab does. And I came to one to the, of the meetings. So that was part of the outreach. So how did they... Did they read your answers on the survey and decide to engage you, or how, how did that work? Well, I, I, was, um, I was not pleased with some of the services that I was receiving at the time, and I thought it was a great avenue for me to advocate not only for myself, but for other people that were um, going through the same thing I was. And I accomplished that. So that's an amazing example. She was critical of her health center, and instead of the health center going, okay, that's enough of her, they said, come closer. So how does your health center respond when you're criticized, when someone says this isn't working? Can you receive, her health center received constructive criticism and saw it as an opportunity. How often when someone criticizes, do you, do you say, hey, let's be better friends? <laughs> what, you think we're doing that wrong? Let's have dinner, right? That's in essence what her health center did. They were able to go, well, this is someone who can think critically and see something, come on in. Right? Someone else, how did you, how do you with your health center do this or how did you do this? How did you go from being a consumer who's helping people to being involved in the system and the structure of an agency? Um, I started out um, being a patient at the health center that I live, live by. Um, and I was um, 
you know, I was devoted to getting my life back together again. And one of the things I had to do was do the physical, the mental, the spiritual, and the emotional. And I got all of that at Duffy Health Center where I live. It was through a relationship that I had with one of my counselors there that actually um, suggested I, I um, well, she suggested and it was asked of me to, to join the cab um, because of my lived experience and my experience in the work that I do. So. Absolutely. So another example of, like what Cowboy said, a provider looking for that. A provider that when someone engages them as the patient relations team or a counselor, someone, I'm looking for those people who can be a part of our consumer leadership, right? I'm not just checking people off the list. I'm looking for what could I call out, right? I'm going to bring it up to you, Cathedral. With me at first, I was homeless, so... Um, I had Miss um, Perry came up to me, so she took me to the shelter. So then after I went through the shelter, then I started going to the clinic. So then she said, why don't you um, join the cow? And I told her, okay, I'll join. So I used to wear a heavy coat every day, my hair all certain things. Uh, I was shy. So then I met met Ted, well, Ted, Mary, Aunt Terry, Perry, David Perry, then Brian, then um, Tim. Then I had got Lionel and John. Then I got some other people to join too. So we all, and I'm still with the cow. So I like it. So then I. Then I came, so I've been with the cab since 2013. Then I came to my first thing right here. Um, Denise became, she became my mentor. So I've been going ever since. That is a beautiful example, right? This is what we're talking about. That's exactly what we're talking about. One person invited her. Now, off the top of her head, she can list off 10 people, right? And they all look to her, and she's the leader, <laughs> right? She's the vice chair. That's right. So that's an amazing example. That's exactly what we're talking about. Kendall? Kendall, microphone. That one. Out. Okay. I went into our home as a patient in our homeless health care clinic and, you know, I was always telling them, oh, you know, some people, some people, some people. And I, I started talking with uh, my provider and I was like, well, I would love to join because like, you need, we need people like you in the cab who know how to express themselves. So my provider recruited me for our cab. And one of the things about it was, you know, I was one of those type of people who expressed myself, but I wasn't able because I was working, you know, the kids coming along. And so what I suggested was, well, if it's after five o'clock, I can come. And then they start thinking about non-traditional hours to have the cab. So that's one of the things you should think about. Everybody is not a nine to fiver. Everybody is not a nine to fiver. And our cab meeting started at six. They had a dinner where we were out by 730 and it was convenient for me. So you have to think about that as well. That is an awesome point. Think it, once, once they started reaching out, there had to be thoughts around what do we do about transportation? What do we do about child care? What are, we, are you going to miss meals? How do we accommodate the job that you have? Right. Deidre, did you have something? I did. Uh, I'm practicing speaking in front of people without sweating. Um, but you, <laughs> because you mentioned me earlier with Cowboy, and, 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 and I'll tell you, Joseph Benson changed my life. And he hates for me to say that, but... I was those individuals that I was housed and I had mental wellness issues, major, major mental wellness issues, but I was considered successfully housed, going to the clinic to get services. One of the services that I was not eligible for because I was housed was the free meals that they got. And Joseph was the man in the kitchen behind all the delicious food that they were serving. 
And um, I believe he caught me trying to uh, get in line <laughs> to get some of his food. And literally, that's what I was going for, was really to get that food. They gave you breakfast and lunch. And I had to go see my doctor and all this good stuff. But my case manager at the time informed me after the fact that I did what they call change talk. And that was because I was talking to her and I said, okay, I'm housed. And I've been housed for a few years. And now I think I, I want to do something with myself because my main focus was just getting housed. Um, and still battling with my mental wellness issues, still going through the trials and tribulations that I was going through, but I wanted to do something else. And when I say it took this man to say, okay, I see you in here. <laughs> I see you try to get my food. That's awesome. Participation outreach. Yeah. That's, That's awesome. Yes, that. I'm, I'm, I guess I'm good with people. I don't want to say everybody, but I'd say I'm, I'm, I'm good with people that's been through the same thing that I've been through or going through what I've been through. So I could talk to them. But I would say that, yes, he gave me an opportunity to be involved. And I think that was the main changing factor in my life was that someone saw me for one and gave me an opportunity to get involved for two and at the and for number three I had no idea what I was doing but I received training on how to give a CPO okay I, I received training on how to do it do you answer, you know, give the questions. Do you read the questions? Do you just let them read the questions? Do you, you know, and I was just like, I realized even with the CPO is that some people's reading is not where they wish it would be. So I would read the questions to them. And then some people's writing was not where they would want it to be. So I was like, okay, so this is your answer. Would you like for me to write it down for you? Word for word. I'm not going to just paraphrase, put it in my own things and make it sound better, look better, whatever. Your own words. It gave me an opportunity to give back to a community or to a service provider that helped me. But it also gave me tools on how to engage. And I didn't even know that's what that was in the beginning. I was being taught how to do this work right? And it was a wonderful opportunity. And Cowboy made it sound like, hey, just get on a call once a month. Wouldn't you like to travel and go to conferences once a year and then go to a leadership summit? You know, and then I said, no. <laughs> no, I couldn't even fathom that. You want me to leave my city? I've never left my city. Well, I did. I mean, I'm from Georgia, but I lived in Houston. But still, I'm like, I've never done this before up until this point. So when, when I, cause I heard somebody say, how do you start a consumer advisory board? You have talents of being able to engage with consumers. You see the light in them, you see their possibilities. And all you gotta do is say, hey, you wanna get on a call? A call? Well, I could do that. And then it starts from there. You just plant the seed. And that's what happened for me. So thank you. What I really like about Deidre's story, and I'm going to come to you, what I really like about Deidre's story is a couple of things. I mean, it's a beautiful story, but a couple of things that, that help really well with my point here <laughs> is that, first of all, Deidre was housed, but she didn't feel like she had it all together, did she? What she just mentioned is she still felt like she had some significant struggles, and she did not decide these significant struggles that I still have disqualify me from helping, and Cowboy didn't think that either, right? She could say to Cowboy, I still have all this going on, but I want to help, and there were people that looked at Deidre and said, yes, you still have all of this going on, and you can help right? So we have to be careful who we disqualify. Sometimes you may say, well, we're not going to disqualify someone because they're housed or unhoused, but a mental health issue or a substance use issue or, right? Someone comes to you and say, hey, I want to help. What is your answer? And what I also think is beautiful about that story is that she did not immediately join the cab. The cab leader, the person in the cab said, you could do a survey, right? You could do a survey. 
she, he realized she may not be ready to come to a meeting every month and to, you know, fill out the forms and to check the, oh my goodness, our provider's leaving. <laughs> Hopefully he'll be back by the time I get down there. But th he said, you, he's returning. Oh, they have lanyards. Y'all got all fancy while I was making the boys and things. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. He's on call. He's real busy. But, he is. He's a provider. You know, they can never sit in a room very long. So, so it, they, it wasn't just join the cab or nothing. It wasn't just join the cab or nothing. It was, we're doing this survey. Can you help with this? We'll train you to do this one thing, right? And she had success in that, and her engagement grew, right? She had success in that, and her engagement grew. So if you have a consumer who was wanting to help and who has some ability to help, is it cab or nothing, right? Is it, is it board of directors or nothing? Then you've only got one open door and it's just kind of cracked, right? But what are the many ways that this person can get involved? You could help with this survey or you could be on this work group or you could see about joining our board of directors. You know, what are the many ways that this person can help? And thinking outside of the box of just your board of directors or just your cab. Go ahead. Uh, you can use the mic behind you if you want to. We do, uh, not we, the National Consumer Advisory Board does a consumer participation outreach survey every two or three years. There have been years where they did it every year. And so they pick a topic. Um, the last one we did was behavioral health services during COVID-19. They pick the topic, they create the survey, they go to their health centers and conduct the survey, they bring the information back, the data is analyzed, and then they present it, which is what, we're, what they're going to do Wednesday afternoon. More to come, but probably just between them, okay? So, all right. So, we have the consumer who is um, wanting to help and who has the ability to help and who's already helping within their community. We have the uh, cab leader who is looking for people like this and the provider who, when he's in the room, is looking for people like this, right? When he's not, I don't know, just wandering around. <laughs> I'm just kidding, Paul. <laughs> That's right, yeah, when he's not documenting and stuff. So we have the provider and, of course, the staff liaison that we're going to talk about because she's got to have the cab filled up, right? They're all looking when patients come in the room. They're looking for those who can get engaged and for those who can help. So what does this process look like in your agency? Who in your agency is really good at finding the people like this, right? And how do they call it out? And if you have a provider who goes, you know, this provider, uh, he might see someone, he might meet someone, but that's all he's going to do. He's never going to do anything else. Then who could he talk to? Who could she talk to? But this is the first step, in my opinion. These people exist in your agency. These people exist in your agency. If your first thought was, we don't have anybody like that, then you're missing something because they're there. So how, who sees them? Who calls them out? What are the open doors for them? If you're, for many of you, the break is in consumer engagement is right here. No one sees them, no one calls them out, or they're given this big job to do that they can't, you know, it's all or nothing, and they're not getting the support that they need. So for some of you, you need to think about consumer, I feel like I'm about to slap you both in the face. <laughs> um, it, it's right here, right? So notice in the stories that were told that we, we use the example, several people of a cab, and I put cab leader here. But who are the people in your health center who are already thoroughly engaged, right? They are on your board of directors. They're informing decisions. They're passing out surveys. They are, like, like was said by Cece, when they talk, people in your health center listen, right? The CEO listens. The HR person listens. The medical director listens when they say something, right? It's really important to know who are those consumers. Hopefully there's some structure around them, like, like Cathedral mentioned with the cab, like others mentioned with the Consumer Advisory Board. And that could look like a lot of different things. If you are using a panel or a work group, who are those leaders? How are they recognized, right? Cathedral has a title. As soon as she took the mic, David Peary said, she's the vice chair, <laughs> right? Anyone from that health center knows Cathedral. So how do you do that in your health center? How do you title that person? How do you call them out? 
does it just have to be that, well, yeah, the um, medical director always listens to Cathedral, but it's just because they, they, you know, she has a cell phone number and they go to the same church, you know? What is the structure around that? If you can't do a cab, what are the options that Kayla mentioned that you could do? Like a panel or a work group or a list of subject matter experts. Who all has access to this person in your health center? Is it just the medical director? Does everyone know this person and know how to get in contact with them, right? What support will this person or this group of people need? David? Yeah, what, what I can also say is that it's important for CAB members to be interactive. We don't just show up just for the meetings and the sandwiches and the food. But um, Cathedral is a perfect example of this because she is singularly probably the most active person within our CAB. Um, she led the CPOs. In fact, we did two CPOs, I think, during, during her tenure. She's involved in every activity, um, especially um, on a monthly basis. We do a CAB serves lunch to our local homeless shelter. And so she's always at the forefront of the volunteers to, um, to, to show up at these events. And all these events have a practical effect in terms of, of, of people understanding who, uh, who the CAB is, what we do, and in terms of building and maintaining the recruitment of members for the CAB. There's a lot of people that could be looking, for example, case managers who, who's always in interacting with people um, that, of course, the cab leader is great, but there's a lot of people that are just like me, just I'm the resource lady, so I already know that you, you got a voice and you're willing to advocate for yourself, so I know that you're one of those people that they can reach out. There's a lot of different people that see that and you can learn how to get that information and share it so that way you can always find a consumer leader. All right, so what, when we think about the, con the established consumer leader, whether this is the cab, the whole, every member of the cab, whether this is your consumer that you always go to to get their opinion, the established consumer leaders within your agency, what support do they need? What opportunities do they have? Does your agency have through them? What threats to your agency? What threats to them in this work? What, what support do they need? How do they get it? What, Think about your, the viewpoint of this person. What do they need? What do they get? What do they want? Somebody, somebody help out. If you've served on a cab, you may know the answer to that. But what support does this person need? What can go wrong with this person? Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities. First of all, we need a mentor. We need somebody that um, still is on and go get, it, go get it. So when I have a backup to help me, to make me get up and, and say, oh, I got to do that and I got to give back. So when I give back, I'm, I'm enjoying myself when I, when I give back. So when I got that mentor and, and, and she's strong for me, I'm going to undo the right thing, okay? Okay, go back to and, and President Cece. All right, so a mentor, a mentor um, breaks right? That you haven't signed your life away, <laughs> right? It's like you're not doing this for the rest of your life, right? What else? Somebody up here said self-care. That's like rule number one. You can't extend yourself too much. Um, I know that obviously you do the paperwork for confidentiality, but you need to make sure that the person understands what that means and when it's important because a lot of the boards will talk about potential things, potential programs, potential projects. And if that person doesn't understand that that's a potential and not a promise, they can start talking about it. So they need to understand confidentiality and when it, when it is the most important. So if you're talking about finances, you can't t talk about how much money is in the budget. Um, if a particular thing comes up during um, HR um, committees, 
So if an issue comes up with someone being disciplined, you can't talk about that with a fellow member or another client. Um, if you start talking about things that you want to do with your budget and it's not a reality, it's an idea, but then you start talking about to other clients, oh, well, you should, because it's that you're getting excited about the potential of something moving forward and progressing, we want stuff now. We don't want, we, we can't think about the process of what it takes to get to them. So you have to be careful about what things are and what things aren't because people will start to talk about things that aren't happening because funding fell through or, or, or you can't get a permit or whatever and, and people get their hopes up or I'm going to tell Paul like, oh my God, guess what we talked about in the board meeting? We're going to get X. Yes, yes. And then the person starts asking, well, why isn't this happening? And people get frustrated. So you need transparency, but you need to know when to be quiet, when to, psh. That's a really good point, isn't it? Another, another thought along those lines is expectations. And I'm gonna come to you, Valerie, and then to you, Cece. Have you ever, um, have you ever worked with uh, like a consumer group or, cons or volunteers? and you do a project and you work on the project for a couple of months and at the end they say, but people are still homeless. <laughs> right? Have you ever had an intern like that? Have you ever had a staff member like that? Have you ever felt that way? <laughs> Have you ever thought, I've been doing this for 10 years and people are still homeless, right? We've learned how to talk to ourselves about that, right? We, we, we understand the expectations. What if we start a cab and they believe that their number one goal is to get everyone housed, when in reality their number one goal is to help people access health care, right? So at the end of their tenure, they go, wait a minute, we didn't do anything. Everyone's still homeless. Oh, that wasn't the goal. That wasn't our goal. And then, then they're heartbroken and they're defeated. And worst case scenario, they're angry, right? And they feel like everything you're doing is pointless. Right? So clearly defining expectations, I think, is huge. We're talking about this as an idea. We don't know if it's going to happen or not. Right? We're going to do this, and at the end, this is the goal. Right? This is what a win looks like. A win looks like you surveyed 50 people. Woo! Right? That's a big win. No, none of them got housed, which is sad, but that wasn't the goal right? But you surveyed 50 people and we're going to take that information and it's going to be easier for them to come to the doctor. It's going to be easier for them to be healthy, right? So how do we frame our mission? We have to do this with each other. We constantly have to remind each other of this, right? That you're making a difference and what you're doing is important and you're helping people. And there are people that are alive today because of what you do, right? But we didn't solve all their problems, right? So framing what it is we're doing is going to be very important for this group right here or because if they get angry it's going to spread all over right not to mention we've hurt someone right so yes expectations i think are huge and i think for some um health care for the homeless program so you had a consumer leader and you divide that up into two positions one sits on the board of directors board of directors and the other meets with the consumers so that is the difference the one that sit on the board of directors go to all the meetings do not share information with the person who meets with the consumers so being very intentional around who gets what information not in a exclusive way but in a caring and compassionate way. Who gets what information? And are we giving information to people that are going to be burdened by it? You have some consumer leaders that you bring in, and if you tell them, hey, we're in the red, our budget's not doing very well, they're going to be destroyed by that, right? Or we had two patients that we had to tell them they can't come back. They're going to be destroyed by that. So who gets information that they can handle, right? Um, Cece, and then, are you, did you want to say something, Rodney? Okay, so Cece, did you want to say something? I have lost CC. Okay. Okay, then we'll get back to CC. So I'm going to do uh, Rodney and then Kendall and then Cheryl. Oh, she's back. 
Okay. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to say when you're a leader as a consumer, when you're like the, the board chair or the chair of the cab, you can delegate. That means you can set officer positions so you don't burn out. Because take it for someone who does not say no. I think everyone knows that. The next thing is food is one of the places where you can find a lot of your HCH participants when you're trying to recruit. Ask me how I know that because that's how they found me. <laughs> Number three, when they're going out to do those outreach, you meet the participants where they're at. So they need to hire some consumers that are skilled assessors so they can do the assessment, although I know it's confidentiality with Paul and Church's chicken, but that's how you can get these people into the housing survey so they can get pulled. And they also need to know each time they go to the doctor or to the emergency room or something occurs, they need to tell that consumer that's a skilled assessor so they can put it in coordinated entry. How do I know that? Because that's how I got housed. Kendall? You might need to go to the mic. I don't, it is a little hard to hear you up here. Talking about privacy and confidentiality, I was one of the presenters with the Coalition for Supportive Housing, and we were talking about privacy and confidentiality. And some of the things that we don't realize is that when we're walking down the hall, my department has a release of information or confidentiality agreement, but your department doesn't have it. And we're walking down the hall, and in the heat of trying to help this person, in the heat of kind of help this person, we kind of lose track and say, well, you know, the young lady with the wheelchair and four children, Barbara, you've really breached her confidentiality because you don't have a release from that department to the other. So there's a very thin line. But in the heat of trying to help someone, we have to keep our heads up straight and say, hey, we can't talk about this. Let's talk with her and let her, let her give us the permission so we can sit down and talk about it. And um, one of the scenarios was that there was an instance where they were talking about a client and they were wanting to help her. And... The person that she didn't give permission to talk about it came to her and asked her a question that the person she did give information about, and I was very discouraging because she didn't want that department to know about her substance abuse issue, and we have to be careful if we don't have the permission, walking down the hall talking about a client and you don't have permission is breaking some HIPAA laws, so that's in line. Just be careful of it. Absolutely. Charlotte? Thank you. Uh, I want to steer back to the original question about what it would take to support that consumer chair, that leader person. And what came to my mind first was authoritative validation, both with her peers and with those that are staff. Because she's standing there as the representative, but is her authority being expressed and understood by all parties? The staff understand that this person's word, we are valuing it for the furtherance of establishing leaders. She has a difficult task and she does it as a volunteer, okay? So her peers can understand and say, hey, they value what she says and she's a consumer just like me. So now that makes their opinion more valid. So there has to be a way that that chairperson is pictured or is put in a light of an authoritative position in order to undergird her effectiveness. So that would be what I would say would help that person to be more effective. Yeah, that is a huge point. Is this just a figurehead, right? Does this person actually have any power to make change, to have an impact, to recruit? Does this person actually, is it just a meeting that has no purpose, right? 
what's discussed in this meeting? Does it have any impact on the health center? Does it have any impact on the patients? Does anyone important in the health center listen to what this group says? If the answer to that question is no, you better believe she's going to know that. You better believe she's going to know that, right? This is a waste of our time. We get TA requests from cabs that are dying or cabs that have died, right? Where they, and there's a lot of reasons why that can happen. We saw a lot of that after the pandemic. So many people calling saying our cab doesn't exist anymore. And of course, we all can think of all the reasons for that. But this is one that we hear a lot as well. They just felt like it was pointless. Well, that may be because it was pointless, right? We're getting together and we're talking and we have good ideas and we're dreaming and we're, but no one's listening to us. Right? But no one answers my calls. Nothing happens with the information we discuss. So, yes, absolutely. How does the health center frame this position, these leaders, how do, what, it, what impact do they have? And how is that clearly talked about? Absolutely. Go ahead. And then Hi. back in the back, too. Uh, you're next. Okay? <laughs> Go ahead. Hello. My name is Tracy. I'm a person with lived experiences. I'm from Atlanta. But I hear you guys talking about walking in the halls, talking in confidentiality. But I haven't heard anyone say you can't even send an email with a client's name and date of birth, through an email, through a text. I, I haven't heard anybody bring that up, mm -hmm. and I just wanted to mention that. You, confidentiality, you can't even like, oh, hey, so and so. And I, I, I have people responding to me like, I don't do initials, or I don't do this, a client ID numbers. What's the client's name? Can't give it to you. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, so I just wanted to mention that as well. Absolutely. You've got to be up to date on that. That is, you can get in so much trouble with that and hurt people. Mm -hmm. Hey, everybody. Oh, damn. I'm sorry, I'm a vocalist. Uh, <laughs> at any rate, uh, one of the things, what it looks like to me, first of all, have you guys ever like been overwhelmed, like even with cleaning and things of that nature, where you, oh, I mean to do the dishes, I mean to do that? That's how I'm starting to feel about this meeting. It's a lot of th different things. So if you are, we talked early this morning, I heard you say something about not being able to remember things. If you are, if from this point on, can we implement something where if you mention an acronym, you say what it is, because it is your everyday life, but it's not everyone in the room. Next thing, it looks like what's being formed is kind of like a line of defense. So everybody on this team has a role, and ultimately, everybody has to play their role efficiently. Now, you don't only have to do your job, but you have to do your job well. That's the other thing. Certain things you need. Anything I struggle with, I have to have three major things. Structure, consistency, and accountability. If I do not have those things, I am not going to be successful. So again, I will say that structure, consistency, and accountability. I understand that sometimes you don't want to say, well, I don't want to just have them come in because they get to get paid for it. But I guarantee you, money motivates people, not just poor people, OK? So it works, all right? That's the other thing. Implementation, again, is one of those things. So again, when you're talking about this person here who is your consumer, whether they're a cab member or all of those different things, they're going to need support systems. So it's not just you just saying, come in and fill a role. But I only heard one person in this room say somebody trained them. And training is something that is missing in the workforce, period. OK? That's one thing. I got the best training of my life from Starbucks. I'm not going to even lie. They have four rules. Tell, show, do, feedback. That's what it is. You tell them how to do it. Then after you tell them how to do it, you're going to show them how to do it. Then after you show them how to do it, you make them do it. Because this is where you actually learn. This I know for me, I'm a kinesthetic learner. So I muscle memory, I, I, I depend on those type of things. And I have to do it myself over and over and over again before I actually learn it. Then you give me feedback and you say, oh, you did real good with that, but mm, you could actually work on this. Okay, so we have things that we have to work on because ultimately what we really should be doing is rebuilding and saving ourselves over and over again. Okay, so you don't have to experience homelessness to be able to say, um, I, I don't know what homelessness is like. What you know is, like I was telling my friend Kaylee over here at lunch, hey, you don't have to be homeless to be able to recognize or be able to say, you know what, I know if I was homeless, I wouldn't want somebody to treat me like this, okay? So start at basic levels, the things that your mama told you. 
you know, treat people how you want to be treated, things of that nature, and then, you know, we can move on. I think it's an admiration that you are the chair of the board, okay? You know why? Because I'm like that too. But you know what? For me, it wasn't something where homelessness was the main thing. My whole life is not about homelessness. It was a huge thing because of an illness in my life. And what made it so wonderful for me was that it actually gave me a sense of normalcy. And I appreciate that. So gratitude is one of those things that is there. Again, I'll say structure, consistency, and accountability. Those things are definitely needed. And so we can think about those three with all of these, right? What is the structure? Oh, what is SCA, structure? she just gave it. I'm sorry. Yeah. Structure, consistency, accountability look like for this person. What does it look like for this person? We can look at that at each role, right? Absolutely. All right. Staff liaison. Woohoo! So, again, what you need to be thinking about during this time is where does this break down in my organization, in me, in my organization, in my team? Okay, are we looking for people? What do we do when we find them? How, do we have existing leaders and are we giving them they, the support that they need? A lot of that is going to come through your staff liaison. We talk to a lot of cabs that are like, yeah, we have a cab and, you know, staff checks in from time to time. This person right here is going to be integral in whatever. Is there someone who it's in their job description to engage consumers, right? That they're getting, they're getting evaluated on that. Are they doing that, right? Otherwise, it doesn't get done, right? What ends up happening, we see this all the time, is Susie, woo, Susie loves consumer engagement, and she calls out people like this, and she started the cab, and she schedules their meeting. It's not in her job description, right? Susie just loves it. She just does it. It's awesome. She does all this, and then Susie resigns, disappears, dies. I don't know, right? Susie does it until she's 89, and then she retires and moves to Jamaica, and then it dies, right? Because it was all Susie, and it's not in anyone's job description. So it needs to be in someone's job description. Someone is sitting before their supervisor, and the supervisor is saying, how's that consumer engagement going, right? So what does your staff liaison look like? So what support does this person need what challenges will they face? What strengths will they bring? What kind of training will they need? What will consistency, structure, and accountability, not in that order, look like for them? What does this person need? Trauma-informed training, absolutely, right? Trauma-informed training. What else, Cece? That's, that's number one, trauma-informed care. And having knowledge of substance abuse and mental health, and having compassion for one another and looking at people in a, a skill-based uh, setting. Know what you lack, but what you have to bring to the table. And accountability, you know, being, a, being an accountable partner, a partner that is going to not only tell you how it is, when it is, but in a compassionate way, but with honesty. Because you have to be open with, with the people you work with. Uh, what, whatever background they have, honesty is number one. And uh, that's it. Absolutely. And that's what Meredith does for us. She talks to us, and, and she engages, and she calls. That's what I was actually thinking, is Meredith actually does have all that. <laughs> Did you? Uh, another question I wanted to ask is, what it, the person who's in the staff liaison position, what should they not be doing? I know one of them is conflict and resolution, because sometimes you're going to Like two rams on top of a mountain. And another thing, <laughs> another thing what you just said, what shouldn't the staff liaison shouldn't do? And I think, well, what I would say was they shouldn't take sides on what cab member or participant is doing what or trying to, um, like, get too unprofessional. You know what I'm saying? I call it hand-holding. I want to hold your hand. They shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> Not yet. I just can't match that. I don't know. So, um, well, I mean, it gets me thinking too about the um, the communication, the system, and um, empowerment that the staff liaison needs because the staff liaison is going to be going to leadership of an organization and saying, "If you want this to be successful, we need to change X, Y, and Z about how we run business here." And I worry that a staff liaison could be set up for 
you know, just disappointment or feeling like they're not listened to or feeling as if, oh, you know, change is just too hard. And so I guess it's a question, right? So how have organizations restructured themselves um, and done business a little bit differently to account for these different types of consumer voice coming in? Because it is a change. It, you can't just keep your organization as is and things, think this is going to be successful. Also, you can also give them hope and be consistent to them and, and show them the love that you can give them too. And I just want to throw in um, one thing that we always have to keep in mind is um, that these are volunteers and we need a volunteer coordinator. So I can't remember about that. We were talking about not having them inputting too much. So when you have the cab and having the staff person inserting their ideas and their thoughts all the time and having that take precedent because it really, you're talking about consumer led. That's literally the first that's the first word, consumer-led. Um, you're talking about the ideas and, and the needs, not just the wants, but the needs of consumers. So you should be asking them those questions. What do they need? That should be the first thing when you come in the door. What do you need? Because an organization is always thinking about what they can give and what their thought. When you come in the door, the first thing you come in, usually they're going to make an assessment off of what they think you need, not what you need. And it's triage for you. So if you're like, you know what, I need an addiction program, but I know that you're not housed and I want to get you connected to medical, well, that's great and all, and we can do the paperwork for that, but you came, what brought you here? What made you step in the door? You need to address that first because that's going to build trust with that client. Don't allow the staff members to tip the scales in the organization's best interest. It's always in the best interest of the consumer. Um, I've had this responsibility in my job description for at least 10 years in different organizations. And these are very hard to run. In medical, it's called patient, patient family advisory councils. And to get that engagement and to keep them sustained is really challenging. And the other thing that's challenging is recruitment, especially from someone like me who doesn't have face-to-face -face time with patients. So you have to rely on your team members to make those referrals. And clinicians are your best referral source because if a doctor says, oh, you know what, you'd be a great patient advisor, they'll be like, oh, really? But to get doctors to do that is very challenging. So you guys are kind of making it sound easy, but it is, it's really hard and I'm very impressed by the patients or CADs that are here because that shows engagement. But like I said, I've worked in three organizations and have had to do this and it's very, very hard. So I'm listening for those tips and tricks on how to be successful. That's one thing we really hope you carry away from here, is that we have in the room consumers, providers, staff liaisons, administrators. I really hope that we all hear each other saying, this is hard. And that we don't look at this person and go, well, you better figure it out, or your health center doesn't care about patients, and you, all you think about is providers, right? I'm pointing at you, Meredith, right? <laughs> because that is what, that, that, it was really important to me that this session not become, and that our learning lab not become, well, if you would do it right and listen to us, right? Because this person may spend hours and hours trying to get someone to come to the meeting, right? This person gets yelled at. This person gets yelled at, right? So this is hard. This person gets yelled at and this person gets ignored. This person gets yelled at and this person gets ignored. And this person gets yelled at and this person gets ignored. So one of the things that I really hope we accomplish here as we're all sitting in the room together, consumers, administrators, providers, new, is we all go, wow, it's hard to get connected. It's hard to be the connector. 
it's hard to be looking for this, right? It's hard to be seeing this many patients a day, seeing someone like that, remembering to call this person, hoping I had their email address, knowing that I told them that they would. They call me back when they come back a month later and I didn't do it. And this person says I'm a liar, right? This is hard. This is hard. So having that patience with each other, that we don't yell at this person, right? And we don't yell at this person. And we're always guarding our hearts that we're not resentful and we're not bitter and we're not, right? But we're keeping in mind, this is a tricky job. We get TA requests from this person. We get TA requests from this person. This person's usually quitting, right? Because that's really hard. So just keeping that in mind that there are wonderful things and there are hard things in every chair here, right? Yes. Yeah, hi. Uh, I suddenly got nervous, so please excuse me if my voice quivers. Um, so I work in quality improvement. One of the things I was thinking is, um, you know, if when we have staff turnover, you don't want that position to leave and then that enthusiasm to leave and that position to be vacant, and then, you know, you're picking up pieces. So how do you really embed the enthusiasm of the consumer in your organization. Um, I was just thinking one way I can do that is bring it into the quality improvement realm. You know, bring in that uh, patient satisfaction, that client satisfaction um, survey, but add other elements in there. Um, so really embedding it in your organization, I think is a powerful way to help sustain it and really uh, get the movement keep going. Hi. I'm so glad you stood up and said that. That's what we're hoping is that other positions in the health center and the organization will go, wait a minute, I have a role in this, right? What is my role in this? And that we dream about this at our administrative meeting, in our leadership meeting, in our executive meeting, go, what's your role in this? What's your role in this? Because I think that's what you do have to do. Because like you said, if no one listens to, if no one listens to Meredith, if no one listens to the staff liaison, we see this all the time. It, it was back here that that was said. If no one listens to her, then it makes, all, it makes the rest of the group sort of a moot point, right? I've worked with organizations where the staff liaison to the consumer advisory board had no audience with the administration, had no audience with the board. That staff member wasn't respected. <laughs> they were in some position where they couldn't even get their own requests heard, right? And the, and the cab knew it. Right? So is the staff liaison someone who's heard and what other levels of the organization are thinking about how does this fit my job description? What if everyone's going, how does this fit my job description? Yes. Yes. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Doshin and I'm um, currently a resident here in Baltimore City and um, I'm on the CRC for healthcare for the homeless here and I would like to thank all of the providers that are client driven. We need you guys. We think you guys are doing a very good job. And for the tips, um, the two things that I have is transparency and availability. Um, I've been a client of Healthcare for the Homeless ever since 2015. And I've went through four um, medical providers. And some have been great with accountability and others have been awful two months to get an appointment to come in after coming from the hospital is not acceptable. This is my personal experience. So um, we understand that you guys have a lot on your plate. Um, I would just like to say to definitely that availability, you will have a person that will drop off and stop getting their care because they cannot access you. And um, if I have to talk to three different people and wait three weeks to two months just to get in to see you or a phone call, a televisit, that's not accessible. So um, like Athena was saying before, the here in this city, it's all about atmosphere. And our leader, our mayor, takes no accountability. Nothing is happening. If you watch any of our news cl clips here on YouTube while you're here, every time it can be, um, I don't know, God himself. You have a lot of people tuning in that has not been tuning in previously um, of different walks of life. There really has no need to be a part of a conference like this or to come down to healthcare for the homeless or 
to go over to Salvation Army and do anything for anybody. However, they understand that if it's gonna happen to this lovely lady right here across from me, it's gonna happen to me. So if they're breaking into my and in, in, into her house, and she's ten blocks down the street, and I'm in a, di a totally different zip code and a different pay grade of living, it ain't gonna be long before they get ten blocks up the street and get to my house and get to me and my kids. And they're chiming in and they're telling our leaders, "Look, this is what's happening." And our mayor still said, no, nah, that didn't happen. You can't prove it. And the whole thing is, you can get away with what you want to get away with right now if it can't be proven. And that's exactly how we're living here. And so when the young lady was saying accountability, that, that's it. Nobody wants to take accountability for what's going on. You know, and when we come to healthcare for the homeless and we can't get availability, we done. We completely done. And what happens at that point is that we become part of the problem instead of on the side of the solution. So when you say, okay, we're just, they, they're volunteers, they don't have to do this, or I'm here to be a doctor, I don't have time to deal with this. When you don't stay on course and make yourself available and have tr transparency. If you can't get to me, fine. Go to the case manager um, head. Go to um, the psych, the, the um, mental wellness head and say, look, my client has been needing this and I haven't been able to do it. I can't keep up with my caseload. I'm working at three different clinics, blah, 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 blah. blah. Could you go and do this for her? Can you go and do this for him? Can you go down to that shelter? Can you go down to that rehab program? Can something get done? That's why we have to have transparency. If you're having a hard time with this, don't keep it in. Don't, don't just be like, oh, I can't get to it. Oh, I don't even wanna see. I've showed up for an appointment and my provider has not seen me because they know they didn't do anything in the last two to three months that they were supposed to do to keep me on course. We have to be transparent and we have to be available. Those are the two tips that I have for making this whole thing work for the client, for the volunteer, for the provider. Absolutely, I think that's absolutely essential. All right, so what else? When we think about the staff liaison, what should she do, what should she not do, what support does she need, what are the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats around that? Kendall, cowboy. Myra. In order to make recruitment work for the cab, the first person that you need to buy in is the CEO. Because none of that works if the CEO don't buy in. Because the CEO is the person that interviews the provider and find out if that provider has empathy for individuals that's homeless. He, they interview the staff liaison's liaison person to see where their mental capabilities are and how they feel about consumers. You know, consumer driven, you know, people use that word and they misuse it. Yep. You know, some people say consumer driven, the only reason why they have consumers on their board is to make sure that, what, no, to get the funding. Yeah, 
But 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 some some organization says that if you do not have a consumer advisory board, or if you're not going along with the with the 330 waiver, you can't get money from us. And then you become tokens. And I'm not going to be a token. You know what I'm saying? So that's when you you start taking and doing the things that make it possible for that board to be a working board and not a token board. You know, and you have to yep. be able to put things down. You know, like on the National Consumer Advisory Board, one of the things that I ask you to do is to spend one hour and be on a committee call. And if you can't spend one hour to be on the committee call, you don't want to be on the steering committee. It's just that simple. You know what I'm saying? Yep. So we're going to go Myra Valerie Deidre, okay? No, no. It was Warren. Okay. Myra Valerie Warren. Thank this you. is a really important point. I can't believe we haven't said this earlier. If your CEO is not on board, this is all right. right. If your board... There you go. If your board of directors is not on board, then this is all in some way is going to be really hard to, to do, right? Who has to have buy-in? A lot of times when we do trainings for organizations on consumer engagement, we do it with the board of directors because the board of directors sometimes think this is absurd, right? So we have to create that. It's, it's, your staff liaison knows it's important, right? She's full of compassion and care and she wants everybody to help, right? But your CEO, if your CEO goes, this is a waste of time and there's only so much she can do. So yes, absolutely. We very often do this training first with the board of directors the CEO, and then and then work it down. All right, so it's going to be Myra, Valerie, Warren, okay? I was just going to say the kind of support that they all need is the behavioral health because, like you were saying, the liaison gets burnt out because she's working so hard. She's not being listened to just like everybody else. If someone, they don't have the kind of support they need to help them stay in, in this situation and help with everybody, how they're going to stay when they're stressed out because they got all this overwork. They can't keep consumers here and the consumers are not being listened to and all these kind of things are happening to them. They need that support somewhere to go and say, let me take a break and breathe through this process so I can keep doing the good work that I'm doing. So one of the things that I am not is a tap dancer. I do not. <laughs> I do not know how to do this for the organization. I don't do it. I do it for the consumers. And that's what it's about. It's about them too. I'm the staff. I work for them. So it's whatever they want. And when they want something, I let the operational manager know, and she'll let the CEO know. And by the time they get back to him, oh, Valerie, name it, go ahead, just go ahead. Because they believe in me, and they believe that I'm going to do what is best for the consumer first, then the organization. That's just me. Okay. Um. Wow, powerful message from every angle of this. Um, from the work that I've done over the years, working with um, healthcare for the homeless in the Boston region, what we've managed to do is every month, faithfully for the last, I say five or more years, we meet with the CEO, and we meet with the doctors and the nurses, and we get their intake on what services are being provided to the consumers of both disabled, on both sides, physical and mental, as well as the homeless population in general. So what we try to do is as a cab member, myself, serving as chair, I get to see what the doctors are bringing to the forefront. So I'm here to tell you that during my meetings with them, they've been straight up honest on what's going on budget-wise. They don't give me the exact numbers because that's not my business. 
nor my place. As long as it's being presented in a way that the people are being served correctly, that's all I care about. They are there for services that you are supposed to provide. And the staff, the staff are putting in long hours. So it's, I understand the pressure from a business standpoint. Yes, everybody needs a break. Everybody needs to take accountability for whoever's at the top. You got to remember, you're just like us when it comes down to the world of poverty and not able to afford health care uh, on every level. So that that's my whole intake on what I do. So when somebody asks me, why do I do what I do? Because I've been doing it for so long, I'm immune to it. <laughs> OK? I grew up in the system. I know how to fight the system. I know how to talk smack to the system. <laughs> so one way or another, we're going to get what we want, when we want it, and how we want it. Thank you, Warren. I'm going to go over here, and then we're going to keep moving. I, I just want to, I'm going to share some quick uh, social media research for you. Maybe that'll make them on the governor's council on the state level. In my 86 years, I've been Oh, I was just talking. I was trying to figure out how can I, how can I get you guys or somebody to my agency because my agency wants to start a CAB. He's always asking me, how do I go about doing it? I sit on a lot of them. I write bylaws. I create a lot of them. I bring members, but I don't know as far as how can I tell my my agency this is the steps that you take. How do I get somebody from NCH uh, to come to my agency in Atlanta to, to, <laughs> to support my agency to start a CAB? And we would be happy to do that. <laughs> Yeah, that is part of the TA, the technical assistance that we provide. You can request that, and we can absolutely assist. Okay. <laughs> Write you know your name down, your email warrior. address. But you can also send a request through our, check out the online resources, but we can provide resources on that, too. All right, we've got to move on. We've got to move on, okay? Let me talk one more, one more threat here that we haven't talked about. I have seen this destroy cabs is when this person becomes the case manager for everyone on her cab. When everybody on the cab starts looking at this person for private case management, or when this person starts offering case management. So when your cab starts coming, call the staff liaison, she'll get you housed. Call the staff liaison if you need an appointment. Call the staff liaison, you know, where this becomes the mama. That's gonna fail, right? That's not going to work. This destroys cabs. When the, when, if the cabs start looking to her to be that or if she starts thinking of herself as that. This is where, and I'm going, to say this, I'm going to say this very carefully. I talk about this all over the country. I see this all over the place. We want to be a family. But if you really start thinking of each other as this is my mom or this is, you know, you've got to be here for me like family. Like, I can call her in the middle of the night. Like, I expect her to come to the hospital. Like, I expect her to call me every week and see if I'm okay, just to chat. We have, we have to be careful how we use that word, and we have to be careful what we mean by it. We hurt people by saying we're a family. So use it if it's meaningful to you. Use it if it's meaningful to you. I, when I do trainings on boundaries, I talk about this a lot. Because we hurt people by saying we're family, but does that mean I could spend Christmas with you? Does that mean you're going to be there when my baby's born? It doesn't, does it? And especially if you're talking to people who have no family. Then when you say, I'm your family, think about the promise you're making. You're making an oath. And you hurt people. And then she leaves her job. And mama's gone. And people are angry and they're frustrated and they're sad. And who do they get mad at? They get mad at him. Right? And they get mad at the CEO and they get mad at, right? So you have to be really careful that if the staff liaison finds herself calling to check on people, calling to chat, giving people rides, what's her lane? 
right? She needs, to, she needs to know what her lane is. Warren mentioned that. She needs to know her boundaries, and everyone needs to be okay with that. That's the biggest, that's the biggest thing I see that, set, that makes cabs explode. And then we fight, and then there's anger, and there's side-taking, right? Because you become like a family, and families fight like that, right? Because I'll say anything to you, just like I would say to my sister, but she's not your sister. She's in a paid position, and now you've crossed a line. So something to think about. Again, where's the breakdown? What are the strengths? What are the weaknesses? The provider. What's the provider's role in consumer engagement? We've talked about this a lot. We've almost covered all this. But what is the provider's role? How does, he, how does he or she benefit from consumer engagement? How can they encourage consumer engagement? Are there threats to this person in consumer engagement? What, when it comes to our providers, what, do we, what is their viewpoint in consumer engagement? Okay. So what the provider could do at, our, at uh, my health care for the homeless, the medical providers refer people to the cabs. That's it. Nothing else. At my health, at my Cincinnati Health Network, <laughs> health care for the homeless program, refer. That's it. Okay. So Sorry. To the initial interview that comes from that CEO with that provider to make sure that provider has not sympathy but empathy for the homeless community and understand boundaries and understand the most important thing is advocacy so they can pick up on the advocacy of those individuals that are strong advocates for not only their self but for others so they can get in contact with that consumer advisory board in order to make that consumer advisory board have retention and growth. Okay, so this person has buy-in, they're making referrals, they believe in it, we know this from the time we interview them. Why would they have buy-in? How does consumer engagement benefit them? Consumers care about them. Consumers care about them. I will tell you at, at our healthcare center, even before the pandemic, and especially after, when we did a survey of our uh, clients and our consumers, the number one concern was our providers. It was their health, it was their self-care, it was their retention. Number one, retention, because we build rapport and we build trust with them because we've lost trust in everything else. And we finally find some place that's listening to us and helping to meet our needs. And I trust this person literally with my life. And if the organization doesn't support them and take care of them and they leave, we're starting from scratch. So someone else? Go ahead. I wanted to ask how many um, agencies here have somebody from the Consumer Advisory Board as part of their interview panel when they're hiring? I'm just curious about that. Is that like So a when you interview practice? someone, do you include a patient? Do you include a consumer? Right? Is that what you're asking? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Is that like a... Yeah, I did. We do. We do on some positions. Yeah. Yeah, so some, some health centers, it depends on the position, right, where consumer patients are included depending on the position. But I think that is, a huge, that is a huge factor to include, is how in your interview process and your recruitment process are consumers involved, absolutely. If you think about your pharmacists, I know not all of you have pharmacy. If you think about your, uh, your patient relations team, if new patient Athena wants to make an appointment she doesn't know how. She, her phone doesn't always work. She doesn't have a reliable phone number. <laughs> that thing's useless. She just throws it. She just throws it in the air, right? If she doesn't understand her prescription, think about how many staff members she calls. And then that's more work for this person, right? That's more work for your pharmacist. That's more work for your intake specialist. That's more work for your social worker. What if new patient Athena can call Kayla 
and say, what do I do with this prescription? Was this person just benefited? Oh, yeah. What if there are 20 Kalas and cathedrals for every new patient? And every new patient can say, I don't know how to get an appointment, or I think that provider may have lied to me, or I'm not sure what's going on. And Kayla and Cathedral can help all of them. Is this person benefited? This person's life just got a whole lot easier, didn't it? So how do we create buy-in for our providers? How do we help our providers to see consumer engagement really helps you out, right? Because there are consumers who instead of coming to you and, uh, does this person need to have good health outcomes? Does this person have to report on how many of their diabetic patients have their A1C3 go down? Yeah. So if new patient with an A1C3 of 100, <laughs> I don't think it goes that high. <laughs> I don't know anything about A1C3s. Um, if this patient who really needs to get her diabetes under control can get help from Kayla whose diabetes has been under control, wow. Then new patient Athena comes back to see her provider and her diabetes is under control, and she's gotten help with nutrition, and Kayla's gone to the grocery store with her, and Cathedral's shown her how to check her blood sugar, and he didn't have to do any of that, right? We don't even need him anymore. <laughs> so, so how can we inspire our providers and our staff to understand all the goodness that comes to them through consumer engagement? right? Sometimes we're, we're uh, only thinking about consumer engagement as benefiting these people or as benefiting this person. But if this person understands how to get a prescription filled, how to make an appointment, how to uh, do what the doctor said, this person really benefits from that. So how do we, how do we, ca your quality insurance person, your HR person, if this person falls in the health center and Kayla helps and so they don't call HR, that's a big deal for HR, right? So how do we cast a vision so that our providers understand consumer engagement is really going to help you out and make your life easier, right? Um, I think one of the important things, I'll just kind of share a little bit of my experience is I've been, you know, I've held many roles throughout the course of my employment. You know, I've been an outreach provider. I've been a substance abuse recovery provider, a housing provider. Um, and the importance of, and I'll tell you an example, is when I was an outreach provider working with our local homeless health care provider, is when I would take my patients slash clients to bridge the gap from homelessness to health care, and now they're connected to a primary care physician, every time, you know, oftentimes they'll do the blood work and they'll do some, some of those required, uh, um, right, um, <laughs> and and then they would call right away based on their blood work. They needed to come back and see them really quick, right? The provider, the, the medical provider is not going to go out and do the outreach, right? They're going to call me, of course, with the, with the right uh, release of information in place. They're going to say, hey, I need this person, this patient back in to see me. There's something that we need to talk about. They wouldn't give me a diagnosis, of course, or what's going on with the patient. But they would say, hey, can you bring him back in? And, and, and I would, right, within that day or the next day. Uh, those are, the, those are the, an example of the importance of the relationships that we're able to build uh, through our community, right? Whether it be, you know, and I've helped, you know, with a mental health peer support worker, a mental health community worker, rehabilitation counselor, housing provider, and I get, you know, many, many more. But it's the relationships that we get to build throughout our community to help serve the client. Because at the end of the day, it's not about me, it's about the clients we serve, right? It's not about the relationships within our own workplace because sometimes we can act as bad as, well, you guys get the story, right? And what, is, what is going to happen in our clinic is that after the initial interview, after the initial interview, then they bring that person back and introduce them to everyone on the team. And then learn about everyone on the team, you learn that what, each individual's job is and what's expected of him, which let them know that he has people that's going to back him up, that helps him buy into that particular team. Like myself, I'm what you call a clinical community health worker, meaning I work directly with the providers. He don't have to worry about appointments. I'm the one who set appointments, whether it be in-house or out-house. He don't have to worry about whether the person needs 
a driver's license identification, a social security card, a birth certificate. That's my job. I do that. His job is to provide medical. And once he provides medical, if there's anything that he needs to assist that, whether it's getting an appointment with behavioral health or with SOAR or whatever, he comes and tells me, Joseph, I need you to take care of this for me, and it's done. There's no ifs, ands, no buts about it. He has a backup. I'm just trying to see what is the vision for them to with the clinic because I see I think I see which way you're going with it but what does it really look like I think that's it that's that's the question right is what is your vision we're gonna have to we're gonna wrap this session up what I have described here is uh, is a model of consumer engagement that ultimately benefits your provider and your staff and your patients. The gap here is that this model of consumer engagement doesn't talk much about systems, right? We've talked about that some in here, but a big gap here is that while your staff would all ideally feel the benefit and feel involved and communities being created and health outcomes are being affected, we haven't talked a whole lot here about how does this affect how decisions are made and how policies are created and how you know procedures are informed. So that would be a different, if we were gonna have that conversation, then some of the people, this, this would probably be the same, what would be down here would be included, um, would be your CEO and your, hello? <laughs> the projector's ringing, Andrew, I don't know. Okay, so your CEO would be here and your board of directors would be here and your HR would be here because how does this funnel up into policies and procedures? We could go further and say, how does your metro, your local government, what's down here for them, right? Your state government, your Medicaid plan, right? We could take this consumer engagement model and change the players. But I, we've spent a lot of time here because this is, what's, this is what makes it happen, right? But what I hope you dream about and imagine about is what does this funnel into, right? What does this funnel into? How do we help the people on this end to really see the vision? And, how to, and to capture that, right? A lot of that has to do with this right here. In this particular model, all of this ultimately benefits her. But if you do all this work here and there's no connection to your provider or there's no connection to your new patients, then this is just a big circle, right? And they're all just blessing each other, <laughs> right? There can be goodness in that. But then you leave or you never, you never get connected unless you're that person. If this patient is never gonna have the skills or the interest or the time or the energy or the capacity to be Kayla, does she still benefit? Okay, so I wanna take a few minutes. Just I know y'all have just been awesome to hang in here. I know the afternoon session is always the hardest, right? I wanna take a few minutes for you to discuss in your groups and you can get up and move around if you need to. What does this look like in your agency? What are the breakdowns? Who are the players in your agency? Do you have a name you can stick here, <laughs> right? Does it, does it break down here? Does it break down here? What does this look like? What are the strengths in your agency? What are the weaknesses? We're going to take a very few minutes and talk about that in your groups. Then we're going to take a break, and then we're going to finish up. All right, that, let's give this group a hand that's sat here for two hours. <laughs> All right, so take a few minutes to talk in your group about what this looks like for you and your agency. We're going to take some time to talk about what are your action steps from here. How do you take everything we've talked about today and make it very actionable for your agency? So we will meet back here at 3 o'clock. All right?